see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Another week of Flames wins, and we're now a week away from the trade deadline. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk more Calgary Flames. And Matt, I gotta say, it's a lot easier for me to do this show this year, at least, when we've got Flames wins to talk about. Usually this time of year, you and I are talking about, you know, needing to just scrape into the playoff spot. So it's a lot more fun doing it with what we're seeing this year. Yeah, and you look at the nine-game segment, starting with the back-to-back against Minnesota and ending tonight with Colorado. Uh, like the, seven of the nine teams were against playoff teams, and the Flames thus far have gone six one and one. So you know uh, that's a very good start to that nine-game playoff series, and uh, hopefully they can wrap it up with another win against Colorado. Well, let's dive into those. The first game this past week was on Monday. The Calgary Flames were at home for the whole week. They started the week playing our arch rivals in Edmonton and got two goals from Toffoli, one from Johnny Goudreau to lead the Flames to a 3-1 win over the uh, Oilers. Um, Toffoli now has, at this point, had seven goals in ten games since coming to Calgary. I thought in this one that both of the... I mean, Daryl's shaking up the lines a little bit, had different lines for at least three of the uh, of the top lines, but I just thought that the whole team looked tired here. No matter what he did, no matter who he put where, these guys just, both teams just looked tired. Yeah, and it, it's hard when you're playing this many games. Like, the Flames this week are playing, like, today is their fifth game in seven days. Like, it, it's hard to play, you know, even, like, four and seven, let alone five, and it's just, you know, a marathon for this team. And, you know, it, this is where you experience uh, both from Daryl and uh, certain players is instrumental because you just have to buckle down. And, like, everybody's feeling it at this point in the season, and it's, like, it's no longer really an excuse to be tired because everybody is. And we saw that in this game where, like, Edmonton was just dead on their feet just as much as Calgary was, and yet Calgary still found a way to eke out the win. Well, the Flames only got one power play goal. Um, The Oilers had 20 penalty minutes here to the Flames' 10, I personally thought that the fact that the Oilers were shorthanded so much just killed their momentum. I mean, you could tell they were they didn't have the guys in the ice they wanted a lot. They were playing, you know, shorthanded too much. It just seemed like it wrecked their flow. Yeah, and like you could see that with the McDavid and Drysaddle line, like they were not getting enough consistent uh, ice time for, to get their legs under them, and. Uh, too few power play opportunities to really get going either and between the two it gave them a very hard time and like I thought that um, that was probably McDavid's worst game since being in the NHL against the Calgary Flames yeah I I can't remember them all but I could definitely see that uh, I could definitely see that being the case Well, the next night, the Calgary Flames had a back-to-back and again looked tired as they took on the Washington Capitals. Ovechkin ties Yager with 766 goals, uh, and the Capitals win against the Flames here, and this was a um, 5-4 win for the Capitals. Flames' goals come from Elias Lindholm, Adam Rajicka, Oliver Shillington, and another Elias Lindholm. What did you think of this one? Uh, just a quick note before that. Um, I wonder where Wayne Gretzky scored goal number 766 because both Ovechkin and Yager ended up scoring it into the same net at the Saddle Dome. It's just kind of an odd quirk that... Uh, yeah, I don't know. And I don't have those stats in front of me to go look. One of those that ever since Ovechkin scored that second one into the empty net, I was, I've been wondering... Uh, just because that would be a weird coincidence if he did that one in Calgary, too. Well, I'm trying um, to think. 766 probably still would have been his time in Edmonton. I'd have to look at the exact stats. Yeah, or early L.A. So, yeah. Yeah, it, so both Western. I mean, it's not like he was in New York yet. So, yeah, it's very possible it could have been in Calgary. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, just as that random aside, but uh, 
I thought the Flames probably should have won this game, if not for some serious defensive lapses. And, it, you know, Vladar kind of got hung out to dry a bit at times. Yeah, Vladar was a starter here. Uh, he, uh, like, there was a couple of goals that Washington scored where it was the third or fourth opportunity that they got the puck in. And uh, the Anthony Mantha goal, uh, Vladar was just a little too deep in his net on that one. Like, it just some carelessness, basically, by the defense and the lack of attention to details. And if they had been a little bit more rested, I think that the Flames win this game because uh, I don't think those mistakes happen if uh, the Flames are more rested. But, you know, the games like this happen where, you know, uh, you do everything that you can and it's just not quite enough against a good team. I know what you're saying about the uh, the defensive lapses there, but I had in my notes here also a um, a note that that's, that was the case on the offensive side as well. And there was a lot of times the Flames were trying to move the puck in Washington zone and would pass it back to the defenseman or pass it to somebody. That guy wouldn't receive it, and they had to go all the way out and all the way back in again. And that's the kind of sloppy stuff that I've talked about for years, sort of seeing this team you know, not playing really well in the offensive zone. I think it's a big reason they haven't been able to be as um, as successful in the past they have because that you're wasting a lot of time and effort constantly going out and coming back in and going out and coming back in. And I can think of at least a half dozen times when – the defenseman should have had the puck, didn't, and Calgary had to come back out and ruin that uh, that chance. Yeah, exactly. And, it, it, you know, it's one of those small attention to detail things that adds up at, over the course of a game. And, you know, if it happens the odd time, okay, who cares? But when it keeps happening, then all of a sudden, like, you're instead of having, like, a minute, minute and a half in the offensive zone which could generate a goal for they're having to cycle back into the defensive zone and, exactly. you know, waste all that time. And, you know, it, it's like one of the things that like I hearkened back to like the early part of the, sh when we did our show and like, I'd bring up things like the attention to small details, like face-offs and like all that kind of stuff, because like if you're doing better on each of the little things it adds up and it into actual tangible results for goals for and against and you know it to, that game was a clear indication of exactly that like when you see the flames on their game and they're just rolling on the other team like later in the week against detroit like you're just smothering the opposition and they can't do anything and you know if you're playing this inconsistent game then you know it becomes a battle of luck and the luck wasn't on our side in this one yeah i totally agree with that and i think not only the luck but just that i don't know i think I don't want to say the Flames underestimated Washington, but this is not as good a Washington team as it's been in the past. And I think the fact they look tired and, again, they weren't maybe playing as crisp as they have in the past, I think it was just a lot of factors, even outside of luck, just some attention to detail that cost the Flames this game. Yeah. Like, if they didn't play the Edmonton game the night before, I think that the Flames win this game. I it, think you're right. It's just, you know, it, it happens. You know, and it it's disappointing, but, you know, in context with this nine-game segment, you know, like, that is their only loss thus far in regulation through eight games. So, yeah, and, you know, like, you can't win them all, but the Flames definitely could have won that game. And I think the 5-4 score shows that as well. Yeah, and... It's just unfortunate that Ovechkin got that empty netter before Lindholm could score. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Ovechkin, I think Ovechkin was really the only capital I looked at here and said, wow, he's really good. Yeah. Even well, as he's aging and that sort of thing, he's still looking really good. Yeah. Well, when you get players of Ovechkin's caliber, they pretty much stay good 
uh, right through till the end of their career. And, you know, the Capitals are desperately in need of a rebuild, um, much like the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, once uh, Crosby and Malkin and Latang age out. It's just, uh, yeah, it is what it is. And, it, you know, they're in the downward cycle of their team's trajectory and you know but they still are a dangerous team if you don't respect them the flames then took a day off after that washington game and came back on wednesday the 10th thursday the 10th to play against the tampa bay lightning and this is the game i think we're all waiting to see how it would look and you know what the flames would put out there against the lightning especially considering the last two what a good game between two top teams. I thought the Flames played a solid 60 minutes in this one to get that 4-1 to one win over the defending Stanley Cup champions. Yeah, and especially when they got lit up in January by Tampa and played perhaps their worst game of the season in Tampa. Um, I was definitely wondering how this team would respond, especially because, you know, Tampa is one of the three or four best teams in the league. And full marks to Calgary. Uh, they were easily the better team throughout the night. Tampa didn't really have a ton of chances uh, throughout the contest, and the Flames just managed the game and ran roughshod over them. And I do like uh, Booty Hunter, uh, number 13, Johnny Gaudreau, uh, you know, banking in a couple off of uh, Vasilevsky. <laughs> Uh, to score from First behind First one went off his butt, yeah. Second one, yeah. I think, was off his shoulder. Uh, no, they both were rear-enders, if I recall off the replays. So, either and, way, it's Well, you're just... talking about Johnny. Johnny got the hat trick in this one as well. Which, uh, there was a lot of concern after the Capitals game because he got a knee-on-knee -knee hit from Tom Wilson. Surprise, surprise. Uh, with, like, two seconds left in that contest, and it was good to see him actually play in that game, and then for him to get a hat trick was just icing on the cake. Odd to see the aggression we saw at the end from Stamkos, especially towards um, Monaghan, of all people. Those two seem like they're going after two teams that really haven't played a lot, but I think it was just that emotion building throughout this one. Um, I will say here, you said that uh, Tampa didn't get a lot of good shots. I'd agree with that, but I think that Markstrom was the difference. I think if oh, yeah, for a sure. different goalie was in net, I think that Tampa could have easily taken this one over. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, it, when you're playing best on best, the Flames, uh, they just were able to outmanage the Lightning in every aspect, and Markstrom was there when needed, but he was not nearly as busy as Vasilevsky was. And, you know, um, it, it, it's one of those where, like, that game, like, in hindsight after watching it, you, I think, uh, like, Tampa did not play anywhere near the game that I think that they were hoping or expecting in that contest, and... Uh, like, you could see some of the frustration boil over at the end with Stamkos uh, punching out Monaghan for really no real provocation. And uh, it was good to see Monaghan both in this game and uh, the subsequent Detroit game getting a little angry and hitting people. So he, at least he's a little more engaged on that end. I guess my criticism of the Flames game here... Um, would be that I thought they didn't get a lot of really good second chances or rebounds in this one. I thought there's a lot of first chances, and then they'd either be picked up by Tampa or just kind of lost and possession turned over. Yeah, and you also have to credit Tampa Bay for being a good team. Like, um, like yes, for sure. But like, yeah, normally, there, there were sometimes like, we had odd man rushes though, where we should have been there and we just weren't in position. Yeah, and. It's one of those that it's half a dozen of one, half a dozen of the other. And, you know, the Flames didn't quite execute as much as they should have, but Tampa's also an elite team. So, like, even if they're having an off game, like, they're still dangerous and good defensively. That's true. 
And speaking of a team who's maybe the opposite, not good defensively, uh, Saturday night early game, Calgary played the Detroit Red Wings and got a 3 nothing win in this one. Jacob Markstrom got his ninth shutout of the season, which is one away from Kipper's record of 10. Um, big 3 nothing win for the Flames. Lindholm to Foley and Coleman score. Um, note in this one is that Oliver Shillington did not play, so Michael Stone drew back in the lineup for his third game of the year and got a point in his third game of the year, his first one this season. Um, yeah. When you're Were you surprised shooting... to see Stone with Tanev? No. I think Stone, he, I, like if I recall correctly, when he was in Arizona, he played on the left side, so I'm not really surprised by that. Um... It's one of those things that uh, it was nice, A, nice to see that Stone came in and looked like he had been playing the whole time. Uh, but uh, that this team just, like, this was like the definition of a trap game. You have a game against Tampa, who's an elite team. You have a game against Colorado, who's an elite team. And then in between, you have a mediocre Detroit team in, it, coming in. And, like, that's like the definition of a trap game. Where, you know, you're looking ahead, sort of like the Montreal game last week, and uh, Calgary instead focused on the details and just ran right over the Red Wings. Like it, In the it first was period, bad. the shots were 19-1. to 1. Yeah, and like 31-4 to 4 after uh, two periods. And like they actually had a graphic, or 31-5, to 5, they had a graphic after the second intermission and like, uh, four of the five shots for Detroit were 45 feet or further out. So, like, not even really shots on net. Just, you know, like, one of them was from, like, 128 feet that, that they actually counted, <laughs> which was, like, literally a dump in from their own zone. Just because, like, hey, we have to make it a little less embarrassing for you. <laughs> so It's as though Detroit didn't get the memo this game started at 5 because they really, I thought put some pressure on in the third, which was about 7 o'clock. I looked at my watch. I'm like, oh, hey, these guys are ready for the 7 o'clock start. Yeah. I know. Um, like, if they had played that way throughout the game, they might have actually had a shot. But, you know, the Flames went the entire year shutting out the Detroit Red Wings, winning each game 3-0. The Red Wings are another team. You are mentioning that uh, Washington will probably go through a rebuild. That's where Detroit is now, and you can definitely see it. And I thought that really... The fact that it was three nothing is a uh, is a testament to Thomas Grice. Oh yeah, like this really honestly, like if it wasn't for Grice standing on his head, like this could have been a double digits game. Like if the goalie had struggled even a little bit, like it could have gotten embarrassing really fast. And the amount of you know amazing saves that he did had in the first period alone, like the Flames could have been up five or six nothing after one. If not for him standing on his head. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I was the I was saying to uh, Ryan Pike up in the press box that this is probably an eight nothing game if if the goaltender is playing sort of the same level as the rest of his team. Yeah, easily and great on Grice. Like you know, uh, just uh, you know, a lesson to him: don't play that well in a nationally televised game in Canada because you might get traded to the Oilers. Well, I was so, about to, I actually said that somebody uh, last night at the game, one of the other, one of the Detroit beat writers said, wow, it's like he's trying to play his way out of town. Yeah. Like, it's like, uh, dude, you don't want to go to Edmonton. <laughs> you know, let us off to your two in <laughs> quick. <laughs> That's right. Just, just leave me here and I'll find a team in Canada that needs me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, the Flames uh, have now played... Uh, six, 58 games on the season, so almost almost at that 60-game mark, which I kind of look at as the, I guess, the end of the competitive part of the season for a lot of the playoff teams. After that, you're starting to get into that downward swing where you know you're in the playoffs. But Flames definitely are in now. They've played 58 games, 36 wins, 15 losses, 7 overtime losses for 79 points uh, in the uh, Pacific Division. that, Ale by the way, uh, for note, over an 82-game schedule is a 112-point pace. So that would be three better than the Flames' best ever performance. And Daryl's always kind of said you need 100 to make it in. Yeah. 
Uh, so the Flames now 79 points. LA's at 72. They're second in the Pacific. Edmonton at 68. Vegas at 68. And Vancouver at 65. The only team in the West that's doing better than us, of course, is Colorado at 87 points, who still lead the Western Conference. So we're sitting, I would say, comfortably at number two. Yeah. And I think that it, it is possible that the Flames will catch Colorado um, just due to... Um, frankly, Calgary has an easy, easy schedule the rest of the way. Colorado's got some injuries now, too. Yeah. Like, uh, for playoff teams, um, the rest of this month, uh, the game tonight against Colorado, and then not again until the 29th against Colorado again, and then the 31st against LA, with six games against non-playoff teams in between. Vancouver uh, could be a playoff team by the time we see them. True. Uh, then next month, there's only uh, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven games against playoff teams in April um, out of uh, like 14 games. So, you know, it's so a fairly a light schedule. And even the playoff teams are like the lesser ones that are in the wild card hunt, not uh, only one good team. Uh, which is the fir first game of the month against St. Louis. The rest are like the teams battling for the playoffs or out entirely. So, so yeah, definitely is a chance for the Flames to make up some ground there. Yep. Before we move on to talking about the trade deadline, just some interesting stats that I wanted to share with everyone here. Uh, Lindholm now has a career-high 30 goals in one season. He's the first Flame since Aginla to get 30, 30 goals in 60 games or less. So, I mean, really, if we look at if we round up to 60, he's got a, a half point per game um, pace now, which is, which is pretty good for him. Another one I thought was interesting, Matt, is Rasmus Anderson now has 35 points in 57 games. That's a 50-point pace, and I don't think enough people are talking about that bounce-back year he's having. A 50-point pace for a young defenseman like that, that's pretty pretty good. Yeah, and um, like uh, Raz, he has always impressed me, and I think it was at some point uh, last season that I thought uh, he would emerge as like a Roman Yossi caliber uh, defenseman. And we're starting to see that where he's now in the top 20 in NHL in points for defensemen. And he is playing exceptionally good defensively as well and has easily emerged as a first pairing defenseman in this league. And uh, is really doing things uh, excellently at both ends of the ice, except for the fact that he only has two goals. And it's like when Erica Branson has three more than you, you know, Raz, you have to step it up. But, you know, when I think about Raz, though, in his play this year, he's putting it towards the net and someone else is chipping it in. So it's not oh, yeah, as though sure. he's, not, he's not contributing that way. I think Raz could have a lot more, but I think it's also a testament to the depth of this team that somebody's in front to direct some of those to the net. Oh, for sure. It's just, you know, anytime you can, you know, get on a player for, you know, who's kicking some serious butt, you know, you got to point out the one little flaw in this game. I agree that he's a, he could be a top two defenseman, but I never would have looked at him as a guy who was on a 50 point pace. We'll see if he gets there. Yeah. Uh, just a note uh, with uh, Lindholm um, getting his 30th of the season, uh, Manjapane could join him. He has 29, and then right on their heels is uh, Kachuk and Gaudreau with 27 and 26. And then you have to go all the way to 13 with Blake Coleman, and then nobody else has more than 10 on this team. And Toffoli will get there probably in the next few games with how he's scoring. Uh, with eight goals in 13 games. But um, this is where, like, uh, the Flames could use another scoring player at the trade deadline, possibly, to help get some additional depth you know, in terms of offensive talent on this team, just because, you know, when you only have four weapons at your disposal, it becomes a little easy to defend against. 
Yeah, and, and I think we all know they need some scoring. We'll talk about the deadline. Well, let's get there. Before we get there, I want to bring up one more record, and that's that Markstrom now has, and, and I guess it's not even Markstrom, it's a team shutout, as Daryl told the media yesterday after the game. Um, nine shutouts now on the season for this team. The Kipper's record is 10 in one season. So, Matt, do you think that we will, between now and the end of April, get a, get two more? Well, uh, Markstrom has nine, but Vladar also has one, so the Flames as a whole have ten. That's true. And That's true. Um, the team has ten. Yeah. Uh, I could see uh I forgot Markstrom, about Vladi's shutout. Uh, it's one of those things that uh, because of the caliber of the Flames opponents, I could see them getting three or four, frankly, uh, between now and the end of the season. Just Yeah, because... I also question how many of those games Markstrom's going to play, though. Well, and that's where, you know, like, I I think that Vladar could easily shut out some of those teams, too. So, you know, it, it's one of those that will be interesting to see moving forward. And um, I think that I, I think Markstrom, Markstrom will I think finish. Markstrom will get two. Yeah, I, I think that the record is more than likely at a minimum going to be shared with Kipper, but I think he'll end up breaking it. Yeah, I think the way this season's going, he'll definitely break the record. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk trade deadline. We're now just over two weeks away as we record this. It is uh, the 13th of March, and the trade deadline's the 21st, so we'll have one more show after this before the trade deadline, but let's get into it in case there's anything that happens early and we can still cover this. Um, Matt, before we start talking about specific names, looking in general at the roster... What are the holes you want to fill? I'll give you mine first. I think the Flames have two big holes they need. I think they need a right shot forward, and I think that they need a depth defenseman. I think that this team is, uh, how would you say, with the uh, having Ruzitska on the second line, I think that actually helps this team's overall depth. Um, now I think this team needs like two more scoring or like one more scoring forward and one more defensive forward. You could probably get away with one or the other, but I think they need to add at least one more forward. And then uh, I don't really know if they need a defenseman, but it's like if you're able to get like a cheaper defensive forward, then why not add a decent like seven eight defensemen but i guess my worry is if they don't add a defenseman what if a guy like shillington was out long term in the playoffs do we think michael stone is good enough to play say four five six games yes but um it's and, and one... give us the same results well it... no but yes but no but yes you you know what i mean like he can play adequately i don't think that you know, like any time a top tier player gets hurt, like it's you're gonna see. Well, I guess it's same results. Like, I'm not saying produce the same way, but yeah, I guess come in and not be a liability and give us, you know, give us better than let's say neutral results. Yeah, and I think that uh, between Valimaki, Stone, and Mackey, I think the Flames have that mostly covered. But I wouldn't be opposed to one more guy if it's a cheap like uh, Trevor Lewis, but a defensive version therein. Uh, type guy. Well, let's jump in and take a look at some players that uh, we think the Flames might bring in. We'll talk about the player. We'll talk a little bit about where they are and what they're making, and then we can talk about what we think the Flames might give up for them. Obviously, they won't make the deal unless the right return, but let's try to figure out what that right return is. And the first name that we'll talk about is a guy that I think a lot of people have mentioned. You and I have mentioned him on the show as well. Yeah, um, and I actually team. expect that this player will be a flame next year if uh, we don't acquire him at the deadline this year. From the Seattle Kraken, he was previously before that in Nashville, and that's Kelly Yarncroke, a center and winger, right shot, 30 years old, currently making $2 million, and he's cousin of uh, Calgary Flame Elias Lindholm. Yeah, and he has the best English name, last name uh, in the NHL, Iron Hook is what yarn crock means so you know like that's just awesome he's like, currently got 26 points in the year 12 goals 14 assists um i could see yarn crow coming here but i can also see a bunch of other teams jumping in on him we don't have a first i think yarn is going to take a second and something what do you think the package would be for yarn croak um 
honestly, I don't even think it's going to be quite that expensive. I think you're looking more like a, a third and a decent prospect, but... Um, See, I just think it might jump to a second because of the bidding. Yeah, like if it's a second, it's a second alone, not uh, a second okay. and. Yeah, I could go with that. Which, if that's the case, and like you can... It, it instantly pen him to like a four year contract at like the two million. It would be like, sure, done, yay, okay. <laughs> you know, because he's, yeah. he's a very good two way guy who kills penalty. He's basically like a Michael Backlund light. And, you know, he's not as good offensively, but he plays the same generally overall, and he's just a very good two way player. Yeah, and like you said, if you think you can get him long term, then maybe it's a good thing. Bring him in now, get him some success, show him Daryl's system, and then look at this as being a guy that you know will will be here for a few years. Yeah, like uh, this would be like one of the Flames, like in my opinion, main targets in free agency if he gets there. Um, and I I would be somewhat surprised if the Flames don't sign him. That's how like confident like he fits in Daryl's system. And, like, with the makeup of this team. And if Yarncroke comes in at the deadline, where do you see him fitting into the lineup? Probably with Backlund and Coleman on the third line. Because he's basically them. Another one of them. See, I think if you're bringing Yarncroke in, you're probably using him as a center. And I think... Uh, well, the thing is that even though he's a right shot, he can play all three positions and has played all three positions effectively and so that's part of like his versatility is that, that he literally can do everything yeah he can I, I just I think you know you've got to give him a position I think the position they try him at would be center and I'm wor I'm wondering if he could replace Adam Rujicka in the lineup um, just because of waiver eligible or uh, yeah waiver eligibility and that sort of thing I could see him on a line with Toffoli and uh, Mangiapane too is the center and I think that would look really good yeah I could see that but um, I'd also give uh, Ruzitska a bit of a longer look there because he's looked exceptionally good since getting put with those two so you know see how that goes for a bit and then you know, like, that's why, I, like, I was figuring, like, like, if you got him, like, he would be tailor-made for uh, the third line just because of the fact that you can evaluate Ruzitska while, you know, he plays on that line with Backlund and Coleman. And if Ruzitska yeah, I just, falters, I just don't know then I want to can... put him with... I just don't know I want to put Yarncroke with Backlund. Like, I think that there's some defensive talent there that I'd want to separate those guys if I could. True. But, you know, it would also make that third line, like, the shutdown line. And, like, especially in the playoffs, like, any time that, like, uh, the other team's first line's out there, you're, you've got those guys smothering them. And, like, all three yeah. are really good players, so, uh, you know. And uh, Yarncroc is also very quick on his feet, so, uh, like, he's he'd be one of the fastest flames on top of it, so... Uh, that's where I'm thinking, like, if you're wanting to make, like, an uber third line as, like, a shutdown and, you know, smother third line uh, for playoff opponents, uh, that would be an excellent fit. Yeah, but there, again, there's options it, there. Yeah, exactly. And options is always, like, the name of the game, uh, especially where the Flames are at because of the fact that you need that flexibility because the Flames do have so many players that can shift positions or shift in and out of the lineup, depending on what makes sense. Yeah, and I think the fact that, you know, it could be more than one viable option also says that going to the playoffs, that's good because we can show different looks based on what we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, like, it, it, say, like, uh, the Flames play Colorado at some point, like, you'd want like uh, yarn crock with Backlund and Coleman to help shut down and slow down that first line. But uh, if you're, say, playing a team like Minnesota, you might want that kind of defensive game spread out a little bit because there's not as uh, much emphasis on the first line being so much significantly better than everybody else. 
The only downside to Yarn Croak, I think, is that we can't afford him right now, even if we were to make some logical moves. You'd have to find somebody to retain some salary. I think you were mentioning the second round pick earlier, and I think if you could give a second round pick to Vegas, or sorry, Seattle for him, I think you could probably convince Seattle, while the price, I think, of a third and a prospect makes sense, I think if you were willing to give up a, a second, you could probably get them to swallow some money as well. Yeah, like here, take Richardson or um, Richie or something uh, in the deal, so that way their cap hits off our books. I wasn't even thinking of that. I was just thinking of them just absorbing some of his salary. Like you know, if if uh, if they will retain seven hundred fifty thousand, we can make it work. Yeah, it's one of those that you know, like I, how would you say? I think that like the hierarchy for the like so-called extra forwards would go Lewis, then uh, Richie, then Richardson, based on usage lately. Um, so, like, I, I would kind of expect them, like, if they're replacing, like, the top end of that list with Yarncroc, then you'd shift Richardson out just to keep the Similar to line how they did with the, Fo with, um, with, uh, the Foley deal where they sent Pitlick out. Pitlick out, yeah. And that way, like, I, I, the other team's not having to, like, say, like, they want, they're want they wanting to trade Giordano, because, like, you can only absorb uh, cap hits on two contracts. Like, if they're wanting to send out Giordano, uh, they can eat half of that and then one other guy, and I don't think they'd want to have that one other guy being Yarncroc. Yeah, I can see it going either way. I, I think it definitely could be sending a guy out, but at the same time, I think if the Flames want to be competitive because the roster limit is over um, after the trade deadline, I could also see them saying, you know what, we want to have as many possible bodies as we can. True. You know, in case something should happen, um, I can see them saying, oh, yeah, we want just more possible bodies. So uh, two great possibilities there. Another guy that I put on my list, again, I'm kind of looking at right shot forwards um, and teams that aren't in the playoffs. I could see Vinny Henestrosa out of Buffalo being a possible option here. He's 27. He's making just over a million dollars. Right shot. Uh, he plays center and right wing. This year he's uh, got 18 points. He was projected to be in about the 29-point range this year. Again, I think for a cheap depth forward you're not going to get as much production out of him as you might for your own crook and he's probably not a guy you're bringing back necessarily this year but i think if you're just looking for a a depth third line forward that's cheap Hin hinnestros would be worth looking at yeah it's basically like the uh great value version of yarn croc does almost everything just as good but not quite so you know if they can't get yarn croc uh, Hinnestroza fits the bill in a very similar manner. Um, he'd be more of a third, fourth line guy, but uh, rather than the flexibility upwards. But then again, you're probably only going to be paying a fourth. So well, that's it. Yeah, the the price is a lot cheaper, and and it might even be possible to get Hinnestroza plus someone else if you're. I mean, it depends how much you want to deplete your draft assets. True. And I I so, could definitely uh, see. Like, if they go for a bigger name, um, I could definitely see them getting Hinnestroza too, just for uh, that, like, fourth line spot. I think is going to be the guy that's not going to be on a lot of people's radar in terms of, you know, high-priced acquisitions. So I think he might still be, even with the, the bidding on some players, I think he might be a guy you could get just before the deadline. There's always one or two times when a trade sneaks in right before the deadline. I think he could be one of those guys. Yeah, I agree. Um, another player here that I had on my list again, looking at sort of cheaper. I'm not. I'm not convinced the Flames need to go out and make a hockey deal or get a you know two three guy. I think really I'm looking at a depth guy, a third fourth line guy, and another one. And we could debate if we think that Anaheim is in the playoff hunt or not. But I think you could also look at uh, Sam Carrick out of Anaheim. He's a 30 year old. Right shot, center right winger. He's making seven hundred fifty thousand, so easy to put in under the um, under the salary restrictions the Flames will have. He's got sixteen points in the year. I think this is a guy that would be definitely a third at the upper end. Yeah, and you're probably looking at like a fourth or a fifth round pick to get him. Uh, 
uh, another like of the replaceable depth guy who's decent but unspectacular. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think we need I don't think we need spectacular, but a guy that I think could help, you know, Hinestroza, Carrick, I think both guys that could help you in the playoffs by having yeah, serviceable it'd basically NHL players. be like going out and getting Trevor Lewis if Trevor Lewis wasn't already on the team. Yeah. Which Yeah, fine, neither one sure. neither one has a you cup know. and I think a big part of the Lewis appeal was the Stanley Cup. Yeah. And it's like sure, fine. You know, like those guys are decent serviceable like 13 14 guys to me those sure. those are the forward equivalent of the Derek forward deadline deal from a couple years ago exactly serviceable does their job yeah and it's 750,000 the flames have no problem getting Carrick in under the uh under the cap yeah and so like especially ta- like with uh the fourth line if like Dubé is not playing good enough offensively or defensively you might see him swapped out for the playoffs anyway, and you could see guys like Carrick or Hinestroza playing on that fourth line with Lucic and making more sense in terms of the style I was going to say, play. I think both those guys would be a better fit on that fourth line. Yeah. So just in case anyone's wondering about how the deadline day cap stuff works, Ryan Pike broke this down on Flames Nation. Um, the trade deadline's at 1 p.m. Mountain, and teams need to have a cap-compliant 23-man roster as of 1 p.m. As of 101 p.m., the cap still applies, but the roster limit does not. So you can have as many players on your active roster as you want, and that's when the uh, teams can have four non-emergency callers from the AHL. That's when that rule kicks in. The easiest player to float down to the AHL in the event the Flames need to clear some cap room would be Rajichka just because he's uh, he doesn't have to clear waivers. So I could see him going down and coming back up. And we've seen that a few times in the past where the guy kind of yeah. tags Paper up and transactions, comes back. Yeah. Um, and then I could also see um, if the Flames send Rajishka down, they have 1.7 in deadline day cap space. I could all see Michael Stone and Brett Ritchie get waived that weekend just to give some cap flexibility. And again, if you need to, you might float one of them down there and, and then bring them back up a few days later. Mm. I don't think anybody's going to claim Stone or Ritchie. No. Like, I'd be somewhat surprised. Maybe not 100% surprised, but a little three two other players i had and then one you had these guys are no longer right shot forwards but guys i think could meet what the flames need if they don't necessarily want to go with the right shot um one of them an nhl veteran and we've seen the nhl go or we've seen the flames really going with the veterans this year a guy with lots of playoff experience uh, and that's zach parise he's 37 he's uh, making the league minimum right now playing on the islanders and i could see the flames bringing him in just another veteran body yeah that would be an underwhelming get but you know not bad parise to me would be the guy that if if you can't get anything else done i think you could get him minutes before the deadline but i think that would be your sort of last resort move yeah and I think that like he gets traded for like a fourth round pick or something like that. Not a very. I think there'll expensive. be a lot of suitors for him. Yeah, I agree. I just don't uh, think that the return is going to be particularly overwhelming for the Islanders. No, and I and I don't think you'd expect it to be for a thirty-seven year old. No. Another guy that I could see the Flames bringing in. He's a left shot, and I would prefer him. Uh, even over, I guess I'd bring in Hinestroza over this guy because Hinestroza is a right shot, but that's Nick Paul, who is currently playing in Ottawa. 26-year-old, can play left wing and center. He's making $1.3 million. Uh, this year he's got 18 points, 11 goals, 7 assists. I could see Paul being a guy you might look at on free agency just to fill a bottom six spot. He's wearing an A in Ottawa. And I think if you couldn't get Hinestroza, this is another guy who I think could fill that same third, maybe second line in a pinch. I think he could work well with some of the guys we have there. Um, and, and again, a reasonable contract to bring in. Yeah, not arguing on any of your points at all. I think, you know, I, I could even see Paul playing with Coleman and Backland. Yeah, uh, another versatile player. Um Good play on any of the position, like any of the second, third, or fourth line. 
And he's a big body too, so that also helps. And a solid middle six option. Um, not anything to get overwhelmed by. But if we got him, it'd be like, yeah, that's a decent acquisition. And that I think you'd it. have to pay a little bit more for Nick Paul just because he's younger. But I could see a third and even another conditional pick being the price. Yeah, like a third and a sixth or something. Yeah, of, I could see that. it being like, we'll no. give you the third. And if, if Paul, you know, plays so many playoff games, you get a fifth. Otherwise, you get a sixth. I'm thinking something like that. Or if Paul re-signs, yeah. it goes up. I don't know I would give away a roster piece to get Nick Paul. No. And again, like unless you were adding somebody for cap dump purposes like Richardson, uh, there's no real point. No, and you could fit him in. I mean, we said that if they send Rajichka down, they've got 1.7. He's 1.3, so I think you could find a way to work him in there. Um, and then you added to list a guy that you've had on our list for a couple years around this time, and that is um, Gustav Nyquist. We've talked about him a few times for the Flames. I think going all the way back to when he was in Detroit, um, yeah. you've liked him. When he got him. traded to the Sharks, yeah. Um, 30, 32-year-old, he's a left shot, plays center wing. The downside here is you got to find a way to get five, $5.5 million under cap. Yeah, and that's the little a bit of an adventure, but it's also doable. Like, um, like if the Blue Jackets were willing to eat some of his contract and um, we were to send a body back, uh, I, it would be doable. Um, he I'm has... trying to what what body would you send back? Like the only one I can think of would be Dubé, and that becomes then more of a hockey trade. Yeah. Which that's fine. Uh, yeah, Ny Nyquist wouldn't be a rental. Like he's under contract for next year as well. So, um, and that's another thing that scares me is I don't know. I want to add another five and a half to the salary cap for next year, where we already have a bunch of guys that we're going to need to resign. Well, and that's uh, part of uh, why I think it would actually be a better idea to get somebody with who's good and good value at the five million dollars. Uh, under contract for next year because realistically like the flames are going to have to lose one or two out of Lucic, Monaghan and Backlund uh, next season regardless and if you can manage to have a guy like Nyquist just like getting to Foley um, you're basically locking in another good player and so you'll have six really good players a seven if you count Coleman uh, that are under contract for next season and you can maneuver like if you were to say buy out Sean Monaghan you'd save four million dollars uh, Lucic uh, after July 1st he gets paid his like signing bonus and then is like a seven hundred thousand dollar player getting a five million dollar cap hit that's a huge boon to a whole bunch of teams yeah, and you need Back to just get to the cap floor, but you don't want to pay anything really for the player. I think there's a bunch, there's a handful of teams. I won't say a bunch, a handful of teams that could look at Lucic that way. Yeah, and then you have Backlund, who's you know even at the five million dollars is still a serviceable player uh, if they want to just you know make a hockey trade. Um, so it's one of those things that like if the Flames were to get Nyquist, even though he is under contract, like the, it wouldn't impact Kachuk, Manjapane, or uh, Gaudreau to any significant extent. Because if you're shutting, uh, say, the Doroff's contract and like all of that, like the, there's more than enough dollars where you could pencil in guys like Peltier and Phillips and, and Rajitska into the lineup next year. Uh, on the third and fourth lines to cheapen things out a bit and like have a, a really good top end of the team as well as having the good youth coming up as well so what do you think you'd have to give up to get Gustav Nyquist at the deadline uh, at least one of the seconds in Dubé and probably the equivalent of another second and what would that equivalent be Either the other second that the Flames have or a prospect that's doing well 
uh, that's a recent good draft pick. See, and to me, uh, I think for a dead for a deadline deal, I think that's a little too much. I don't know. I'd want to give up both seconds. I think if you're going to go that way, I'd look at making that deal the draft then. Well, and that's um, you know, to me, like this team is basically the closest to being a cup team since '89, frankly. Um, and I think that like this is the time when it's better to overspend a little bit and go for it. And like I can understand like True Living's uh, reticence for uh, rentals, um, because like if he was a rental, uh, like uh, even a second in Dubé would be like oh, ouch <laughs> for uh the player that Nyquist is, but. Um, if you're getting him for next season as well, um, then, you know, like magically, uh, you know, like the extra added cost is buoyed by the fact that you're getting a really dynamite player to potentially win a cup this year and maintaining the team's overall strength next year, um, when a whole bunch of contracts end that make things a lot more flexible, like Nyquist, like Toffoli, like Backlund, Monaghan, Lucic, like all those contracts end next year. So My hesitancy is just that I guess we have no third, no fourth, no fifth, so if we have no seconds, then we draft in the fifth and the seventh round. And? <laughs> like, honestly... Well, like, I, I know I, what you're I, saying, and yes, we we got to go for it, but I, I mean, even the best teams in the league have to draft players to keep their... Well, you know, and that, their system going. Yeah, well, and that the thing is, is that like the Flames have been really hitting the mark with their drafts lately, and like they have a bunch of guys that are on the cusp of making the NHL and coming up through the system. So like they they have a very stock cupboard, where like if they were they, to they have some tweener. Yeah, okay. I, they have. I would say they probably have three or four guys that are really going to be top end prospects. Well, and that's where, you know, like, if you look at teams like Chicago, like uh, Pittsburgh, like Boston, like, when they actually went for it, you know, like, they had years where, like, they didn't really draft very much (laughs) in particular drafts, and it wasn't until late round picks because of the fact that they went for it. And, like, Calgary does have a huge prospect base, uh, not necessarily on the high end, but, you know, a lot of guys that are looking like NHL caliber defensemen, NHL caliber goaltenders, and varying degrees of second to fourth line forwards, you know, so, like, there's enough there where if they skip a draft and perhaps invest heavily in, like, UFA uh, prospects and uh, college free agents... Like, that might be a way to buoy some of that. But, you know, it, it, I think that it's – how would you say? Let's say rather... worst, worst case scenario, the Flames don't make it past, let's say, Colorado and don't make it past the Western Conference Finals. Does that then look like a mismanagement of assets? Not at all. And that's – the reason why is um, because, like, guys like Nyquist and Toffoli have an additional year. Um, it – because basically you're saying like we're going for it now but we're also going for it next year because like next year like all the draft picks are still there for the next year's draft and you've got like the full roster of players because like you're gonna have like the top six of Kachuk, Gaudreau, uh, Lindholm, Mangiapane, uh, Nyquist, and Toffoli if th- that were to break out and then guys like Backlund, Coleman, and Prospects on lines three and four, you know, like, that's a really good group of forwards. And um, at, at that point, like, the Flames are still going to be an elite team in the West next year and could possibly add at the trade deadline if they're going to go for it again. But, you know, like, it's... Like, how would you say you're getting two kicks at the can? instead of just one if you were to spend a little more getting a guy with term next year then you know 
Uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I just, I don't know. The 5-5 five, five for two years, if I was the GM here, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just, if I was the GM, I don't know that that's the deal I'd be making right now. I think I'd want to leave some money to play with to brace sign some of those deals and then look at bringing in a guy like um, a guy like Nyquist at the draft potentially. Yeah. And like, how, how would you say like, it, I just, it, I think that for this year, I don't know that you're going to get a huge boost bringing him in over a guy like yarn croak. And I think that the cost of acquisition is significantly different. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is that like, if you're, loading up uh like for at the draft like it doesn't make any more sense than to go for like a guy who's a ufa next year you'd have to like look for guys with extra term you know because like i I don't like true living really does not like rentals and i don't blame them because you're literally flushing assets down the toilet (laughs) Um, I just think you can make a hockey deal for him with one year left um, at the draft. Like, you know, maybe yeah. move Dubé and something. And well, by then yeah. you'll have, I think, a better idea of who's signing and who's not and what they're going to cost. Well, and that's the the problem is, like, you're basically, like, if you're waiting to the draft for, like, Nyquist or any, you know, of that type of guy you're basically you're only getting one part of you know it and like like the premium that you'd be paying is so that way you're getting two kicks at the can instead mm-hmm. of just one and you know it is, is it worth like the extra second or third to get nyquist for this uh playoff run and have him next year Versus going getting a Nyquist equivalent at the draft of, you know, whomever. Because, you know, there's lots of different options open up at the draft. And Yeah, like, no, I, I totally get what you're saying. I'm just, to me, I'm not comfortable giving both the seconds and not drafting until round five. Yeah. Difference of opinion, right? One's oh, not yeah, right or sure. wrong. Just, that's, I, I, if I was the GM, I'm, I wouldn't be comfortable making that deal right now. Yeah. And for me, um, how would you say, um, part of it is, um, like, uh, what Treleving said after he got to Foley in that, uh, the players did their homework and so he had to go do his. For sure. And like, yeah, we got to Foley and that's amazing. And he's played absolutely fantastic for the team since getting here. Um. But, like, the calculus has also changed. Like, since then, the Flames have basically been unbeatable. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, the Flames are now not looking like a good playoff team, but a potential cup favorite. Do you then invest more as a confidence boost for the whole team by going out and making yet another big splash? And saying, yeah, we're gonna go for it right now. Yeah. No, I mean, I get <laughs> and, your logic. I totally, I totally yeah. get your logic. It's just not the price I would pay. I'm not saying oh, you're right sure. or I'm right. It's just. No, and I, I think too and what like, you that's... said though that the Flames are looking so good. I don't know. You need to pay that price to bring in a top end player. Then we're showing that what we have is getting the job done. I think I would be more confident in that case bringing in a guy like Yarn Croak or Hinnestroza or Paul, if we were a team that was, you know, fighting for a wild card spot, I think I'd be more likely to pay that price and bring in Nyquist. Yeah. Well, I also just um, uh, think that, you know, like stacking the deck as much in your favor as you possibly can. Like, how do you say, like opportunities to actually... Not, like not fluke your way to winning a cup but like legitimately like we're the best and get out of our way because the silver wears ours it, like that really doesn't come around too often and like the flames are kind of showing that we're building towards being that you know get out of the way it's ours kind of a team and it's like you know do we quibble over a second round pick like you know and like i I hearken back to like when the flames traded brett hull (laughs) 
which was a really bad hockey deal. I'm not going to argue, but getting Rob Ramage and uh, Rick Walmsley did help them win the Stanley Cup. And, you know, like, we would not be sending any caliber of player anywhere near as good for any addition, <laughs> um, you know, just because, A, we don't have one, but, B, like, no, uh, we're not going to do a Philip Forsberg for Martin Erat situation. But uh, yeah, I, I think I think you know you and I could go back and forth on this all day. Let's just say yeah. two different approaches on this one. Yeah. One's not right. One's not wrong. No. Two different approaches. We'll see which one the team might take if either one. Yeah. But I just think two uh, different ways yeah, of looking like, at things. Like how would you say? Um, yours is the very much the more rational, uh, logical way of approaching it. And mine's more of the feel and the bullishness of, you know, like, well, hey, we're charging, let's go all in. And the, each of, you know, and like that's where having like a hockey ops department is a huge deal, uh, it, where you have like seven, eight, nine voices in the room, each with their own take on things. And, like, that tends to end up yielding the best results at the end of the day. Uh, so that way, like, the team is managed properly and, like, not having someone just passionately throwing everything at the in the kitchen sink at the solution or, you know, being too reserved either. So, like, it, it's one of those finding that right middle ground and hoping that it works out well. We've talked about the forwards, guys, that maybe will come in, maybe won't. And I think as well the Flames need to go out and get themselves a depth defenseman. I'm not sure that you go into the playoffs looking for a combination of Stone, Mackie, Valimaki to sort of play that number seven spot. Again, some might disagree, but I'll throw three names there that I think the Flames could go for. And I think you could get any one of these guys probably for next year's fourth rounder. I don't think the price is going to be all that high. The first guy I'd look at comes from the Philadelphia Flyers, and that's Kevin Connaughton, a 32-year-old making uh, 825. He's six foot two. He's another big guy. He's um, he's played this year for both Florida and Philly. He's been on their roster. Um, has no points, but I think you know as a as a seventh defenseman, he could fit in well. Yeah, he would be more of a sixth or seventh round pick kind of guy, but a serviceable defensive-ish defenseman uh, basically like getting stone with yep. the, you know a less slightly less version of stone but you know yep. he's kind of, he's the least of these of the I guess desirable on my list yeah like the, would, the it, next would one... anybody be complaining if we got him no would be anybody be excited if we got him no it, it'd be just like oh good we have another body yay but I don't think we need an exciting defenseman. Like, no. I think if we get excited by a defenseman we bring in, we'd be breaking up the defensive core. Yeah, exactly. I think this needs to be our Derek Forbort. This needs to be our Gustafson. This needs to be just kind of our extra defenseman who yeah. we know is serviceable. Yeah, exactly. The next guy on my list is, uh, I think, would cost a little bit more, and he's a little bit younger as well. This is Nick Sealer out of Philadelphia, t number twenty-four for them. Again, six foot two defenseman. Uh, this year for Philly, he has three points in thirty-seven games, and I think uh, a, a more complete player than Connaughton, um, a little bit younger, and I, I think would be my choice over Connaughton of those two. Yeah, um, another. Yeah, that's a guy who's playing as a seventh, eighth mm -hmm. guy. You know, a decent filler guy. A guy, uh, I guess, for both those guys, it's better than Mackey. Is kind of the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, uh, the more experienced version of you know, like talent wise, I think Mackey has it on both of them. But in terms of experience, those two have more. And also, you've heard me say this before. I want to keep the AHL guys in the AHL if they're going to go on a playoff run and not be moving them up and down. So I think this is a guy that affords you that option to keep Valimaki and Mackey playing in the playoffs in Stockton. Mm -hmm. um, and the last guy on the list is Dean Kukin. 
out of Columbus. Number 46 maybe could come over on a, a big deal with Gustafson if they end up doing that as well. Another left shot defenseman, six foot two. He has seven points this year. A little bit more expensive at uh, 1.6. So I think, you know, if you bring him in, you're probably not bringing in a, a, a expensive forward. I think it's one or the other, but I think he would be the high end of these three. Yeah. And another serviceable that guy kind of thing and not a bad player but you know a, a good filler and like uh, at this point like with how all of the flames defenders both are playing at stockton and in calgary uh, frankly like the flames don't really need anybody more than a filler guy well, that's like, it. I think all three of those guys are, would be cheap to acquire. Like you said, maybe even a sixth or seventh and get the job done. A guy you probably don't expect to see play in a Flames jersey if everything goes right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, like it, if he's playing more than five games. You hate to say games, that, but you're, bring, yeah, you're bringing in a guy to be insurance. Yeah. Like if he's playing more than five games, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't really start thinking about that until we saw Shillington go down this, you know, this week. Of yeah, maybe we should have a little bit of a, an NHL insurance piece. Yeah. And then Matt, the big name has been thrown around here, and I'll get your thoughts on this. But a lot of people are saying the Calgary Flames should do a deal with Seattle to bring back Mark Giordano. What are your thoughts? Um, I like Mark Giordano. I liked his time here. It's moved on. And this team doesn't have room for him, frankly. Because uh, if he comes in, he's going to be a top four defenseman. And all four of the Flames defensemen are better than him. So there's no real point in, he, you know, other yeah, than sentiment. Yeah, your number seven. You know, and, like, he's better than that. And we just simply don't need him. And, you know, which is shocking frankly <laughs> for how good um all four of the defensemen in the top four have played and a credit to how good uh Zadorov and Goodbranson have played that like there's absolutely no reason to interfere with anybody in the top six like yes Giordano's great and you know I'm hoping that he gets traded to an eastern conference team and goes for it it's just I don't want really see a want or a need for Calgary to go and spend the money and assets to get him in. The Flames fan in me says bring Giordano back, make him the number seven so he's here if and he would get his name on the cup as a flame. The logical analyst in me says I don't want to spend the assets it's gonna take because I think there's gonna be a number of teams that would be willing to pay a price to bring Giordano in. And you know what he We've we've moved on from him. He was our captain. I think it's going to be weird to bring him back and say, hey, you're coming into a locker room where you're not the leader. And I think that could cause more locker room disruption than most people think about when they say bring Giordano back. Yeah, and like this is one of those where if the Flames wanted to bring him back next season in like a 5-6 role for like $2 million, Sure. Uh, you know, like if you're replacing Zadorov, say, with Giordano at 225, sure. But, you know, that's a whole different situation and a whole different team at that point. And, like, right now, like, it, it just, they're both with the internal politics from, like, why he's a Kraken in the first place and, you know, just the lack of a need for him. It just it the it doesn't line up, unfortunately, and like it's unfortunate and it sucks because you know a lot of teams want him to win a cup, but or a lot of people if want we, him to win. If we knew that this was going to be his last year, I could see them doing something where, you know what, you work with the Kraken, you work with him, you do a cheap deal because the Kraken aren't going there. Maybe give up a seventh just to get him his cup. Yeah. I'm not or convinced you could it's have, last uh, year. Yeah. Well, it's one of those where, like, uh, you could pull a, one out of the NBA's playbook where, uh, you know, uh, the team and the player mutually agree to 
void the contract <laughs> and then the player just signs with somebody else. You know, in which yeah, I don't case, even know if that would work under the NHL's deal because I think there'd still be a cap penalty in the NHL's CBA. Yeah. I know. Like, that's about the only way that it could work. And, again, I don't see, like, for Calgary I'm hoping Giordano gets traded, just not to Calgary. Yeah. Like, would I be happy if he became a Florida Panther or a Tampa Bay Lightning? Sure. But, you know. And, you know, if they end up winning the cup with him on it, great. As long as they're not playing us in the finals. But, you know, other than that... Yeah, yeah, not really interested. You know, it'd be different if, uh, like, the Flames had a need for a defenseman. Then, of course, go get, you know. And I think, like, if the Flames had a real need for a defenseman, that they might have already went out and got him. But, um, yeah, not really the case. I, I mean, the hardcore Flames fan of me says, bring Geo back, sign... Um, you know, Iggy again, like get them out of retirement, put them both on the roster so they get their names on the cup as a Flames fan. The realistic part, or as Flames players, the realistic part of me says, you know what? We moved on from both, and it's too bad Jordan didn't get that. I hope he goes, like you said, to an Eastern Conference team that he has a chance with, but I, I think he's going to... I think he's going to be a significant asset moving to the deadline, and I don't think that there's benefit to the Flames paying what it would take to bring him back in to acquire him. I think you you just cause so much unbalance. Yeah, and like uh, frankly, like I could see him getting a late first. You know? Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Well, and and like we we're talking about, if you're going to use those seconds. I would be much happier with your idea of bringing in Nyquist than spending our seconds on Giordano. Exactly. Like, just from uh, asset management, because, hey, at least you have somebody for next year, too. And you know. I mean, I would even be okay to spend a second on Yarn Croak when you may not have him next year than I would on Giordano. Yeah, I agree. Well, especially because the forward group is the greater area of need. and For sure. Yeah, you know, it, it just is. I, and... I think everyone who said Giordano should come back is really looking at it from a nostalgic view, not a a logical asset management view. Yeah. I've run it in my head. I just can't see a way that if Giordano had lost his step and if he was the seventh defenseman in Seattle, sure, let's go and bring him in. Let's make him our additional guy just to, you know, put his name back on our roster. But that's not the case. And I can't see any logical way where unless, you know, unless the organization and the Flames and the player all agreed to some magical you know, nostalgic trade. I just can't see any logical way that we would pay the assets to get Gio and we get a return on it. Yeah, and then, like, how much would that disrupt the mojo that the team has right now as well? And Yeah, and, 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 and it. can you imagine him going back in the dressing room saying, hey, welcome back, Captain. By the way, you're not the captain anymore, and we're not even going to give you an A. Like, this isn't your room. It's just the whole thing behind the scenes would be weird, too. Yeah. You're welcome back. You were the captain here. You were the captain in Seattle, but now you're not on our leadership team. Just sit over there and we'll call you if we need you, which is really what that defenseman we're acquiring's job is, is sit there and be ready and we'll call you if we need you. Yeah. It just doesn't work. So it's an interesting, I guess it's an interesting thought experiment, but I, I can't see a way that you make that work and get the return out of it. I think you're, blowing a whole bunch of assets in that case for nostalgic value. And as you said earlier, I think this team is close. I think this is the best shot this team's had since 89 to win the cup. Any team that is in that position doesn't go out and make those kind of moves. No, not at all. And it, it's very much a business and like, okay, well, what do we actually need to win that Stanley cup? And, and, and not, Oh, this would be a nice story to line to go along with. You know, it just well, and, doesn't... and even, you know, people who say the storyline part, like you said, refer to the Ray Bork deal. And I'll just, re I'll give everyone the Ray Bork deal here, just so you can see that wasn't a sweetheart deal. That was some Colorado needed. It was Ray Bork and Day Dave Andrichuk to Colorado in exchange for Martin Gerber, Samuel Paulson, Brian Ralston, and a 2000. 
2000 or 2001 first round pick, which became Mike Martin Samuelson. Like that was a hockey deal. It just so happened that it was Bork's last year. Uh, second last year, he played one more year after that. That's right. But, That's right. That's but, true. Uh, I thought it might you know, be but last like year. Rolston was a really good player. Like he, that was a good second line forward. And yeah, sorry, not Martin Gerber, Martin Grenier, and even he was pretty good at the time. Yeah, and you know, like like that was very much a a hockey trade, not a you know, and yeah, like it, there's no like it, you, in order to get. Jordan, you're probably going to have to send one of Valimaki or Dubé plus a second round pick. And that's, and that's just, for asset management. Yeah, like you're just lighting things on fire at that point. And really with Giordano being a free agent at the end of the year, I understand is the year the Flames, you know, are the closest and all that. If you feel like he's the guy to bring back, bring him back as a UFA. Yeah. Oh, and Don't one more the asset note. on it. Um, just because uh, this broke uh, just before we uh, started recording, uh, the Calgary Flames have uh, recalled Connor Mackey and sent Adam Rajitska to Stockton. So that would be a cap move is just to make the – because they're tight, so they have to send Rajitska down to make the room for Mackey. And that makes sense going on the road tonight in Colorado. They probably want to just have another defensive body in case. Do we know if uh, if Mackey's in the lineup tonight? I'm just looking up that now. Um, yeah, the reason for Rajitska getting sent down was literally due to the fact that they couldn't put Richie on waivers in time. Um, so, like, before needing to recall um, Mackey, and it. it's more just to... Uh, it's a cap move. Make sure, yeah, make sure that they were cap compliant and it, not a slight to Rajitska, it's just literally dollars and cents at that point. Uh, Daniel Vladar is getting the start tonight, and uh, there's no word. I think it's just that they wanted Mackey, so that way they had seven defensemen on the team just in case something happens between now and puck drop. Yeah, and, and I totally agree, and I bet you'll see, I mean, the Flames don't play again till Wednesday. I bet you'll see that trade reversed. It's pretty much, I, I don't think you can even make on paper transactions anymore. I think you actually have to tag up so I can see being Rajishka, go to Stockton, wait in the airport. We'll fly back tomorrow morning. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and after this game, I bet you'll see the, the exact same thing is pretty much those guys just swap back by Wednesday. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think uh, what you just mentioned brings us to a great spot. Why don't we look at our weekly predictions then? Unless yep. there's anything else trade deadline wise you want to look at. No, it's just uh, I I liked our discussion because of um, the differing approaches that we are looking at for this team, and it'll be interesting to see just how this team responds because both of them make sense and in context, and it'll, I think it'll just shake down to what it, what the deals are between now and the deadline. And, you know, acquisition costs if the Flames actually do go out and get anybody else. I think it's fair to say the Flames will do something. They will acquire somebody. It's just a question of who. Yeah. Who and for what. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think if – I would be shocked if we're talking our show after the trade deadline and the Flames stood pat with their forward group. I agree. I, well, and you can even see that with how they set up the lines uh, – post the Edmonton game uh, where they put uh, Rujitska on that second line which is kind of a placeholder even though he's looked good in that spot and you have uh, Lewis on the line with Coleman and Backlund which again looks like a placeholder and you know it, it'll be interesting to see exactly which is the greater area of need and I think that's part of the reason why they actually put those two players in to see like can Ruzitska be a quality second line player enough where you go and just go get Yarn Croc or, you know, variation yeah. therein? Or do you need Find to go get that is. skill guy? Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Well, Matt, last week uh, we had slightly different opinions on how the week was going to go. I thought the Flames beat Edmonton, Detroit, and lose Tempe, Washington. You thought they lose. 
Edmonton and Tampa Bay win Washington and Detroit. And, of course, we know the team did better than we expected, winning Edmonton, Tampa Bay, and Detroit, and losing only to Washington. So uh, this week we have four games to predict as well. Weird for us to say, but half the game's on the road this week, which isn't something the Flames have had in a while. We have Colorado today on Sunday at 6 p.m. start time on the road. Then the Flames have two days off, and they have the New Jersey Devils on Wednesday at home. Then they get a day off, and they have the mighty Buffalo Sabres. I'm being facetious there. On Friday night at the Dome, a 7 p.m. start time. And then a quick road trip up to Vancouver for an 8 p.m. start time on Saturday. So four games. What are you thinking this week, Matt? Yeah, with you mentioning uh, the road trips, it's like, what are these newfangled flying things? <laughs> you know, for how much we've been at home lately. Uh, yeah, I think that the Flames are going to go 4-0. Wow. I, uh, I think that they're going to give Colorado... The, I think they're going to be up for Colorado again. And the three teams that they're playing the rest of the week are just bad. So, you know, they should, by all rights, beat each one of them. And I think they're going to either go 3-1 and or 4-0, uh, depending on what they do tonight. I'm going to go with the three and one. I think that the the Calgary Flames on a back to back are not going to beat the Colorado Avalanche in Colorado this time. I think Flames are looking a little more tired this week. I just don't think it's going to be their night, but I think they will beat New Jersey, Buffalo, and Vancouver. Yeah. Where do you see Dan Vladar playing besides Colorado, if at all? Uh, Buffalo, pretty much. I don't Getting see the, the home win. Yeah, I don't really see any need for. Uh, the New Jersey game because there's two days off between and Vladar is playing tonight so yeah yeah and then after that Vancouver game Saturday you get two more days off so I think yeah it makes the most sense to play Vladar against Buffalo put uh, Markstrom in in Vancouver and then give Markstrom a two-day rest before San Jose comes yeah and even then like after that there's a back-to-back with Arizona and Edmonton I would expect to see Vladar against Arizona and Markstrom against Edmonton just because I think we're now at the point where we have to start managing Markstrom's minutes yeah and that's where like Vladar playing tonight makes sense and like Vladar playing the first half of each of the next two back-to-backs makes sense and there's plenty of days in between each of the other games where you know Markstrom's going to get his rest in so it's not anywhere near as important uh, for him to be rested and I think it's a backup who's not a placeholder for once. I mean, this is a backup who I think we can have here for a number of years. You also want Vladar to get enough starts to actually develop. Yeah. And it's not he, just about where does Markstrom need to rest like it has been in the past. It's what does Vladdy need to play in order to get better. Yeah, and to be frank, like Vladar has actually played rather well this season. Uh, he has a 8-4 and four record uh, with one overtime loss on top. Um, not the best uh, goals against and save percentage, but um, that's due to getting lit up a couple of times, <laughs> impacting the low amount of games he's actually played more than anything. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, his save percentage isn't bad for a backup. It's not what you'd expect no. for a top-end starter, but for, a, you know, a backup, I think he's got okay numbers. Yeah. All right, well, Matt, it's almost puck drop for the Colorado game, so I will bid you adieu for this week, and we will talk to you next week on the eve before trade deadline. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be an interesting week to come for the Calgary Flames, uh, whether uh, they win out or struggle a bit. It, you know, There's going to be some interesting things off the ice and hopefully a lot of positive things on the ice. And we'll see. Uh, just how everything shakes out. Take us out of here, Matt. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.